hello and welcome back to another YouTube video. Hi, I'm Speeder. Okay, it has been so long since I have filmed a single video with this camcorder. I've mostly been streaming over the past month or so. And I barely had time to make any videos. But what I did somehow have time to do was watch the entirety of the Dragon Prince Season 4 in two days. Well, really three days. I watched episode 9 today, but, you know. <sighs> so, I thought I would make a video on it after my uh, very speedy watch-through on kind of my first thoughts about uh, this season, my first impressions. Um, maybe it compared to the previous three seasons. Uh, but yeah, this video will contain spoilers for the entirety of the Dragon Prince that has come out so far. That includes season one through season four. I was going, I was thinking about doing an initial reaction thing, but I watched it too quick and my phone was dead. I was like, eh, whatever. It's fine. <sighs> but we're back. Okay. We're back to making videos. And man, I wish I had better editing software because I really wish I could make a much better video on this, but unfortunately, I don't. So, I mean, I have to make this as uh, clear and concise as possible before I really learn how to edit, which I really need to do when I have time to do so. But anyways, here we are. Dragon Prince, season four, starting with episode one. Or I guess just, I'll start with overall thoughts. I was really excited for this season, like, really, um, because it, it, I've been waiting, like, a couple years now for the new season, and I'm like, yes, I, I like, pretty much binge-watched those first three seasons, and they were all so good, and it was a clear-cut storyline, and I am so excited to see this new storyline in season four, and then I watched it, and I was like... Huh. Interesting. The first three seasons had pretty much anything I could ask for. They had good amount of humor, uh, had great action, um, well-rounded characters and storylines, and it was something that I felt was worthy of making my first series on reviewing individual episodes on my YouTube channels. And I was like, yes, this is this is one of my favorite series. It's it's so good. <sighs> this season felt almost childish, which is interesting because all of the characters are older, but it felt like I was watching a kids show. Which, I mean, I know technically this is a kid's show, but that's not what it really felt like in the first three seasons. In the first three seasons, it felt like I was watching a show that was made for all ages. This one had so much childish humor in it. And even though I was younger, when I first watched those first three seasons, I could come back to them. I hate this lighting. Anyways, I could come back to the seasons and I could still enjoy them as I grew older. This season had Soren's humor was <clears throat> over the top. Um, in, in previous seasons, it was like it, it was it was funny. I actually laughed, um, and I I also I really like Soren as a character. In this season, though, he was over the top silly. He felt like he'd become a complete comic relief character. He had lost, like, a lot of his core elements, I felt like, that they had built up in the previous seasons. It felt like he had lost his maturity, I guess, and it kind of disappointed me. Callum. First of all, he looks completely different, which I understand that he's 16 now, or something around that, but, like, the haircut doesn't suit him. First of all, 
I mean, it's alright, but it's like, really? <laughs> and he, it looks like his facial structure has completely changed. Like, he, when he, in previous seasons, it felt like he had more of a rounder face. Let me look this up, actually. Um, Callum, seasons one through three. You can see like the slight point of the chin in his previous design, but it's like he has more of a more boyish face. He's he's more rounded, and plus his hair kind of frames his face better. And then I compare it to New Callum, and it's like you can still see the roundedness a little bit, but his chin is a lot more pointed. He just looks like a completely different person, <laughs> which is weird for me, um, seeing him with such short hair, and well, yeah, he looks good, I mean, he looks completely different, but that's, that's just a pet peeve, um, of mine is when they completely change people when they get older, but, anyways, I felt like they were also building up, like, a thing, and maybe they'll do this in the next, uh, season or two, um, in Mysteries of Erevos, but, I don't know. They, I felt like they were building up to like Callum really having a confrontation with his past dark magic use that one time, and I mean he did already, but I felt like he would have more of a manipulation arc with Erevos more than he did. He had like one episode, and I was like, this is kind of boring. <laughs> I we, I want I like character arcs. Okay, that's one of my favorite things is character development, character arcs. And I like um characters that seem to have nothing left to do. I like when they get the arc where they are turned to the dark side and they come back. I like redemption arcs. I would like to list more of them, more of the ones that I know, but we'll start with, with Soren, okay? He starts out as kind of this goofy but kind of unlikable character at the start. Um, I mean, he's a little likable, but he's mostly kind of annoying. Then he... Well, he never turns all-out villain. He's always more of the reluctant type, but he is manipulated by the by the dark side. Yeah, I dropped my nightlight. Yay. Um and then he has these realizations, he has this time when he's like, what my dad is doing is wrong, and then he comes to the light, which is good. I like that. Um I felt I felt like he had a well rounded arc until of course the beginning of the season. And I feel like Callum well, he has a great arc the first three seasons. I felt like they could have continued his arc better in season four. Rather than just making him... I don't know, like a carbon copy of Viren, but with no manipulation at all. I just... I wouldn't have minded him being more of a carbon copy of Viren if they had actually done something with him in Erebos before he finds out that Erebos is evil. Like, you can see him, like, praying on the mirror, I guess. He's interested in it, he's studying it, and... I don't really know what I'm saying there anymore. Uh, Ezrin. Ezrin. I... I don't hate what they did with Ezrin in this season. I think he has one of the better stories. He looks completely different. <laughs> um, I kind of miss the old Soren, and when I when I heard him speak for the first time with his high-pitched voice, because I'm pretty sure it's a girl who voices him, I'm like, oh, this is still so weird. This is weird because he looks way older 
uh, but he still has this like super high pitched voice and it's adorable. But <laughs> I feel like I should still be seeing the old Ezrin, but I don't. Um, but overall, I like what they did with Ezrin in this one. I don't feel like he changed too much, but I think my only issue with his with him is that he doesn't change enough. Almost he. <sighs> He seems like the same person, whereas everyone else around him grew up quite a bit. Yeah. Um, like Callum and Soren. Well, actually, I think Soren grew down, but anyways. I'll stop going on about that one. Claudia. Um, well, I think the way they've gone with Claudia makes sense. I think it... Yeah, I think Claudia's development in this season makes sense. I would like to see a redemption arc in future seasons for Claudia. I think that'd be great. A redemption arc like Soren's, or maybe different too, I don't know. But I would like to see a redemption arc from her. Um, I think it makes sense where she's gone. Um, my one thing is, I feel like it would have been nice to to have a season in between where we got to see them rebuilding the kingdom and where we got to see Claudia going through this development where she becomes like fully what she is at the start of season four. Much more ruthless yet still somehow herself at the same time. Um <clears throat> Viren, um, I think his character was done pretty well. Um, I he was one of the parts of the season that I enjoyed the most. Uh, he has the disapproving father thing, but he also has confusion and kind of what you would expect, almost not quite, but kind of what you would expect of someone who. I just come back from the dead, um, and had 30 days to live. Oh, that was weird. Okay. Um, anyways. Just thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye. That was weird. Okay. I'm kind of creeped out now. Let's continue. Okay. So, Amaya. Great. Pretty much flawless. I like where her character is. No issues. Same with, uh, Janai. Why can I never remember her name? Uh, I don't know. Janai. Janai, uh, also, I think is great. I think her, her storyline, her character, super super well done this season. I like where they went with her character as well. <clears throat> Honestly, their storyline, that whole thing with the Sunfire Elves, best part of season four, but I'll, I'll get into that later. Um, yeah. Zim. Most childish part of this season, besides maybe Soren. But like, the dynamic between Zim and his mother just feels kind of forced and weird and I'm like I'm bored I feel like I'm watching a dog uh, <laughs> and I'm not really a dog person eh. um yeah <sighs> Tim and his mom's dynamic and the dragon queen not a very interesting character to me. I'm like, cool. You're nice, I guess. I would have liked to see some more conflict there before everything just went perfectly, but, you know, whatever. <sighs> that part kind of disappointed me. But, I'm sad that, uh, Popelli and, um, Corbus had, like, nothing in the season. They had, like, two scenes in like the first couple episodes, but that's about it. <laughs> they weren't in this season at all. And they're two of my favorite characters, especially when it comes to things like 
the political side of things and the war side of things, which are two of the things that I really enjoyed from from the first three seasons. And again, I know, it's a kid's show. But after reading things like Stormlight Archive and uh, being able to see, like, all of these different perspectives on politics and religion and all this different stuff that I th I'm a philosophy person. I don't know. I loved Stormlight Archive with all of my heart. <laughs> and I guess I just expect everything to be that good when it comes to politics and war and things like that. <clears throat> Which I think seasons one through three of the Dragon Prince handled that super well. Like, I was kind of inspired by all the stuff there. I, I don't know, I just... I like a show that makes me think, and this season of The Dragon Birds didn't really make me think. <clears throat> let's see. Alright, let's move on from the characters. Okay, let's go on to storylines. So, there were kind of three storylines going on throughout the show. Um, you had, throughout the season, you had uh, Callum, Ezrin, Rayla, um, along with Zim, Bait, the Dragon Queen, uh, and Catalus, right? Uh, and they are just kind of living their lives. Callum is now the High Mage of Catalus, which isn't surprising at all, um, because, I mean, he's the only real mage that is a human. Um, he's the only real primal mage, and Ezrin isn't a big fan of dark magic, as far as I can tell, so, yeah. Um, Soren is still crown guard, which, well deserved, though I wish he was a little bit more of a mature crown guard, but, you know, I'm, I'm good with the comedy, I'm, I'm, I, I love Soren's comedy, but, again, over the top this season. Also, all the fart jokes, not my favorite. Anyways. Um, kind of cringy. <clears throat> but yeah, Ezrin is the king, and he is doing a great job at it. They're also planning a surprise birthday party for Callum, which was incredibly predictable, because first of all, the episode name, Rebirth Day, and second of all, um, what else would they be talking about? Like, no. <clears throat> Callum is obsessed with this mirror um, that we know is like the Looking Glass to Erebos. Um, and the Dragon Queen is coming to visit with Zen. Okay, so the Dragon Queen comes to visit, um, and the Baker uh, makes her a giant jelly tart, which is like the perfect thing to appease her, I guess. Um, people are speaking out against her, they're terrified. This episode, though, <clears throat> Fallen Stars, episode two, uh, or was it episode three, actually? I'm actually not sure. Um, it's episode three, breathtaking. Um, <clears throat> the speech that Ezrin gives at the end of that was one of the best parts of the season. That was actually really good. It felt like the Dragon Prince for it was like five minutes. You had this epic speech going on along with this fight scene in the background and it felt like I was watching the Dragon Birds for the first time while I was watching the season. <laughs> I actually felt like I was watching the same show. And it was great. It was a good speech and it, it felt like something everyone would do. It was in character and it was good. Um, the baker also makes these, uh, 
new tarts, which I can only assume the substance inside was, inside was chocolate, I would assume. Unless it's some other weird thing that I don't know about, but I would assume that it is chocolate. Um, but, after this fight scene, um, we have uh, the Sky Mage guy, who I always forget the name of. Yay. <laughs> um, he's dead, but he sends a secret... No, secret. He sends a message to the Dragon Queen saying that... Uh, Arvos is back, pretty much. That's what it... Not the exact wording, but it's basically what it is. Um... So they have to go stop Arvos from escaping, so they go with Dragon Queen to Stormspire. They discover that this guy is dead. Um... And... They... Find out that some Archdragon, uh... What is it? Uh, Rex Igneous. <clears throat> that number eight. Um, so they find out that Rex Igneous. Uh, so, so as far as they know, he seems to know the location of Erebos's prison. Yeah. So they go to seek out this guy, but unfortunately, the entrance to his lair is blocked off. So they have to go in through this secret passageway in the back, which leads them through a forest of Earthblood Elves. And they go through this secret passageway with the help of this Earthblood Elf guide, who I honestly forgot about within a day, but, you know. <sighs> um, they meet with Rex Igneous, they run into Claudia there, and, uh, along with Viren and Claudia's, also Claudia's new boyfriend. Um, who I am also forgetting the name of for some reason. Um, gosh, give me your name. I'm not forgetting another one. I'm not forgetting another one. Uh, Terry who should be... it's his full name, though. It's Terry, but... Terrestrious, I think is what it was. Was it Terrestrious? Come on, give me his full name. Terry. Come on, Terry. What is your full name? Is it Terrestrious? Terrestrious? I don't want to say this thing, no, I don't want to say this wrong. <sighs> Terrestrious? Yeah, Terrestrious. Okay, so Terry, or Terrestrious, is also with her. <clears throat> Thank you, Fandom Wiki. Okay. Anyways, so, uh, Claudia puts them all to sleep, they find, after they find out that, uh, the map, oh yeah, they also feed, uh, Rex Igneous this chocolate tart, and he loves it, and that's their gift to him, or their sacrifice, I guess. Um, and Claudia puts them all to sleep, after they discover that, uh, he has a map to Erebos on his tooth. Um, and... And they escape from Umbertome, which is the mountain that they were in to find Rex Igneous. And everyone's alive, and oh yeah, Rayla has those coins with her parents and her man in it. Yay. I can't, personally can't wait for those to come out. Um, but their parents and Renan to come out of the coins. But anyways, assuming they can, which I think they can, but who knows. Ah, oh, man. Okay, so that's one storyline. Uh, then we have Claudia, Viren, and Terrestrius. <clears throat> so Claudia has pretty much resurrected uh, Viren with the help of Erevos, and she also has this new boyfriend, Terry, or Terrestrius. Um, 
So she allows Viren to get used to being alive, then they all climb up the storm spire, and I have so many issues with this scene, it's insane. First of all, they could have left Viren at the bottom. Which ultimately they do do, but like, they could have just left him at the bottom. They could have gotten the thing it's themselves, because... The staff themselves, because... I mean, that's what they do in the end anyway. They didn't really need the urn for this. Second of all, Claudia does like a traveling spell to get to the bottom of the storm spire. Can you give me, please, a plausible explanation for why she does not just travel to the top of the storm spire? I have read plenty of books and seen plenty of movies and TV shows that have things like this traveling spell in them. Like, take for example, The Wheel of Time has this in it. Um, but it has specific reasons why you can't just go anywhere. Um, first of all, in most of them, the thing is you have to have been there. Okay, if this is the reason, it doesn't work because Claudia's been... Or has she not? She is not. Okay, that doesn't work, actually, but, yeah. The first thing is, um, a lot of the explanations are, if you, you have to picture the place in your mind. You have to have been there to be able to travel there. And another one is, uh, in Wheel of Time specifically, if you travel to the wrong place, you can pretty much, to my understanding at least, cut a person in half with your gateway. So you have to make sure that you're going somewhere where there are no people, or else you could kill someone, which is fun. But, no, it's not fun. No, killing people is not fun. Anyways. <sighs> Love my wording. Yay. Okay. Um, but they didn't really give a plausible explanation for why she could not travel to the top of the storm spire. There is no lore about this spell. Give me lore about this spell, please. <laughs> then I will understand. Or maybe I won't and just think this is more of a plot hole. Hmm? Anyways. <clears throat> so, or maybe there was like a magical protection up there. I don't know. Tell me. <laughs> Show me. I want backstory. I want exposition. Tell me why. Or show me why. I would like to know either. I mean, they don't tell you immediately about why you can't travel to certain places in Wheel of Time, if I remember correctly. They show why you don't do that. <laughs> it was a terrifying scene, anyways. But, yeah, just show me and tell me. I would like to know. <sighs> yeah, so, they retrieve the staff, kill the Sky Mage on top of the Storm Spire, and they set off to uh, <clears throat> open up this cocoon that uh, this creature that knows like the will of Erebos, I guess, and will help guide them to Erebos. Uh, so they release this creature from its cocoon and it leads them uh, to the forest of Earthblood Elves and eventually to Rex Igneous, uh, which then they use this weird I don't even remember what they called it. Fun stuff? I don't, fun goose? I don't know. But I am disturbed by uh, how similar it is to slime and uh, what is that other thing called? That's like a solid sometimes and a liquid other times. I mean, I know that's like everything, but like, depending on how you press it. <laughs> that, okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, my brain. Anyways, I feel like Felicity Smoke. Okay. <clears throat> but also not. I uh, probably make no sense now, and now you see, if you haven't seen my videos before, why I wish I knew how to edit. Yay. Anyways, okay. Yeah, so they somehow get this map onto this weird stuff. I don't even know what it is. Slime, I guess. <laughs> um, and... I guess...
guess they're gonna set off to find Rexignia. So yeah, also the gang now knows that Viren is alive. I'll go more into depth this, in this when I do individual episode reviews eventually, I promise. <sighs> Not that anyone here wants me to go more in depth, but yeah, no. Okay, so, and then the third storyline is focused, focused on uh, Janai and Amaya, along with uh, Commander Gren. Or is he General Gren now? I don't remember if they changed his title or something. I, I feel like they did, and I recognize that, but I don't remember now. Anyways, um, along with the rest of the Sunfire Elves and humans who are living in this camp with the Sunfire Elves. So, Janai has proposed to Amaya, so they are wanting to get married, which is awesome. Love that. Love also that my camera is going unfocused. Um, so yeah, they're getting married, um, and while... Janai's brother approves of the marriage, or approves of Amaya at least, he doesn't really approve of the marriage part, um, because he fears that the uh, Sunfire Elves will believe that her marrying a human um, will solidify the fact that the humans may be there forever, which they don't want. Uh, they want their old city, Lux Luxaria, back which they can't have, but, uh, yeah. There's this. I'm not going to go too far into it because I'm already, like, man, I'm getting close to my cap at this point. Um, <clears throat> oh, gosh, I feel like I'm losing my voice, which is not good because I have to tell people cues on Friday and Saturday for a play. I miss. Lovely. <clears throat> okay, I guess I only have to whisper those, but, you know. Moving on. Brain. Speeder. Come on. Okay. <sighs> Let my brain catch up with my mouth. Or the other way around? Me. Mm. Okay. So. Yeah. So. Nice brother doesn't really approve of her marrying a human, um, and he tries to convince her not to. She will not refuse. She will not. She, she's going to marry Amaya. Is basically what I'm trying to say. And uh, so he challenges her to a duel of blood and ash, which she wins, um, and he is taken away. And so she's basically going to marry Amaya. <sighs> yeah. I'm not sure which of these storylines I like less. The Claudia, Viren, Terry storyline, or the Callum, Rayla, Claudia story. Callum, Rayla, Ezrin storyline. Um, plus Zorin and Zim and Bait and Dragon Queen. Anyways, <laughs> um, I think... The main storyline with Callum and Ezrin, I think that's the one I like the least, honestly. It... It may not... I don't think it's the most childish of the storylines, but... It, it's up there, uh, and... It just didn't feel like the Dragon Prince. It felt... Okay. Man, I don't know. These ones, these two storylines are kind of really interlocked, uh, whereas the Janai and Amaya storyline is kind of away from the rest of it. But, I don't know, they're both kind of equal. Both of them have kind of an equal level of childishness, immaturity, I guess. Um, we have Terry, who is a trans character, uh, as we discover in, I don't even remember what episode, but that's really cool. Uh, love that. I have some friends who are trans, so I'm not personally, but uh, I have some friends who are, and I totally support that. So, um, you can do what you want. I'll call you when you want to be called. Um, I don't think of myself as that, but you can do what you wish. Um, unless it's uh, against the law or harming other people, I don't care. Yeah. Um, 
yeah so let's see yeah so that's pretty cool um but yeah i feel like both of these storylines have kind of an equal level of immaturity and they both kind of feel, they feel like the dragon prince at certain points but then at the same time most of the rest of the time they just don't feel like the dragon prince whereas the storyline with the sunfire elves and all that feels like the dragon prince that storyline actually feels like i'm watching the dragon prince we have action we have politics we have a good level of humor a good level of humor and it's mature enough that it's like not terrible mature it's not like this is super dry humor but it's not like overly childish like a lot of the rest of the humor in this season is plus there's a little bit of romance well a lot of romance in there actually um and i love all of that mixed together and it all makes the dragon prince that i know and love i believe that that storyline is the best one out of the storylines in this season but anyways I guess that's just my first thoughts. I have so much more to say, which I know I just made a freaking 40 minute video on this, but that's what I have to say for now. That's my first thoughts. <sighs> this season was kind of childish, but it was good at parts. Uh, it wasn't the worst thing I've ever seen. It was not Miraculous Ladybug, which I only follow now because of the love square, because I am a sucker for a ship. But anyways. Okay, um, also I would recommend li reading the comic between season 3 and 4. But anyways, that is all I have for today. I don't know when I'm going to be able to make another video, but I found some time tonight, so yeah. Anyways, sorry for the bad lighting again, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.